everybody, Josh Searson, World Alternative Media here, and I am joined by the one and only Cynthia McKinney. And, you know, it's amazing how many things you have accomplished. And it's amazing that we haven't yet been able to talk. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for being at Red Pill Expo. And I, ha I guess I have to thank uh, G. Edward Griffin for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share my experiences and my thoughts about, um, I guess, everything, including yeah. what is this deep state, you know, yeah. we're talking about everything. Yeah. And, and you know, a, a thing or two about the deep state, of course, you had questioned uh, Donald Rumsfeld all those years ago. Well, and if you can I'm, give me information to I'm that effect, I'm sure you we will... are interested in all of the information that I have, and I'll be more than happy to provide it to Good. you. Good. Thank you. But I would also like to get information from you. But I, I wanted to kind of go into the idea of uh, volunteerism with you. So the idea of individuals ruling themselves um, outside of government. Not to say no government, but moreover, uh, voluntary governance. Um, what are your thoughts on the ideas of volunteerism? Well, I, th I think I prefer, um, instead of using the word government, that I like to speak in terms of governance. Mm -hmm. And what that does is that it allows us to get outside of this huge superstructure that's called mm -hmm. government and then look at how we organize ourselves in order to accomplish the goals that the community and the individuals in the community set. So like power centers. Well, I call them power cells, right? Oh, yeah. You know, but right, exactly. And um, so the govern government well, government is not responsive to the needs of the people anymore. And so what is the alternative structure that we need to build, that we need to create so that we can realize what it is that we need, we want mm -hmm. to do? What's the quality of life that we're looking for? What kind of values do we want our life to um, uh, represent? Mm -hmm. And then in terms of policies that are carried out by the community, how does that look? Mm -hmm. And so I think we've got to start thinking in ways that we haven't thought before, in very non-traditional, non-conventional ways. And that would include even the structure of a government and um, thinking about ways in which we can stop thinking about governments and think about governance. Mm -hmm. And uh, what have you learned most since uh, being that dirty word that we call politician uh, uh, several years back? Um, what, what is the greatest rabbit hole that you've gone down since mm. you've been in government? Mm, the greatest rabbit hole. Like what's something that you've learned since being in government that you kind of wish, I, I suppose, when you were... I didn't know. That yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, one, that it's all fake. Mm -hmm. You know, that was really a very sad moment for me when I, 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 I uh, served on the House International Relations Committee. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the particular subcommittee, I think it was Western Hemisphere subcommittee, was having a hearing. Mm -hmm. And the chairman of the subcommittee was there. I was on the subcommittee, so I was there. Mm -hmm. And then the committee, or the subcommittee, were interviewing, had um, a panel of witnesses that were being questioned mm -hmm. by the subcommittee members. And it looked like it was a normal event. Mm -hmm. Then, all of a sudden, the um, chairman of the subcommittee, we sit down, we go through the hearing, the chairman of the subcommittee is fussing mm -hmm. at the uh, witness. Mm -hmm. And the witness is antagonistic toward the chairman of the subcommittee. 
So there's some friction. There's electricity. There's something happening in the air. After the hearing is over, the chairman backslaps the witness and they walk out together. It was just theater. It didn't mean anything. So that was like the saddest thing for me to, to realize that it was all just theater, didn't really mean anything. And uh, that's probably the harshest lesson, but that's the realist lesson. Mm -hmm. And while this point might not be as popular among this crowd, while I do have great respect for everyone that's speaking here at the Red Pill Expo, and Ed Griffin is a great friend of ours, um, I've noticed that going back as far as you can look, every president has ran on the potential for change. Uh, we've seen that uh, for a couple hundred years now. And uh, we've seen that with uh, Bush. He actually talked about auditing the Federal Reserve when he was running. Uh, you know, Obama, change we can believe in. The first black president that sounds very anti-establishment and then we have Trump now and he goes under the he, he's seen as very anti-establishment and we see medias attacking him with false information mm -hmm. but at the same time we also see false information in uh, supporting him in places like mm -hmm. Fox News etc mm -hmm. um, the military industrial complex looks like it's going down over here but it looks like it's being propped up over here yeah. and I have to ask um, this has caused a l vast amount of divide among the populace um, you know people are fighting themselves themselves instead of the real enemy. Yes, Is there a concerted right. effort to divide the populace? Uh, I wouldn't say just using Donald Trump, but using this, you know, dog and pony show of uh, politics. Oh, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. And it builds so beautifully off of, you know, when my hopes on the hill were shattered by watching the chairman and, you know, they walked out arm in arm. Yeah. It was all a charade. Okay, so I would go back to uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire, and he outlines the mechanisms of oppression and the tools for liberation. The mechanisms of oppression are conquest, manipulation, divide and rule, and cultural invasion. The tools for liberation are cooperation, organization, unity for liberation, and cultural synthesis. So now, what does all of that really mean? What it means is that one of those tools that has been shown to be tried and true is divide and rule. So if we can balkanize the population put everybody into their little silo, then you're absolutely right. Nobody will be paying attention to the people who are doing the balkanizing. And that was the point of my remarks yesterday that I wanted uh, uh, the, the audience to understand that we are what we are today because some people had a plan a long time ago and they, like my campaign manager said, make your plan, work your plan, and your plan will work for you. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. And do you see there uh, to be a problem with, you know, people expecting government to change things rather than you, the individual? Are we just apathetic? Are we just sitting here looking at, oh, well, Trump is going to drain the swamp and change everything. We, sh we can just sit down and relax until the next election. Do you, do you find that that is kind of starting to happen or has been happening since the election? Well, I certainly hope not because, um, well, you know, I, I think that the Hillary Clinton record was one that certainly absolutely did not warrant her uh, being rewarded with the Oval Office. So there was no way that I would be supportive of a Hillary Clinton presidency. Now we've got to the point where, okay, we have to maintain that same vigilance with this president. And if we don't, then if we fall into that trap of complacency, that or even worse maybe apathy that you're talking about uh then we will deserve everything uh, that we get uh, so that's why i'm here at the red pill expo because and and you know and i love those young people at anarcha at oh my goodness you talk about one day saying um man 
this country is in bad shape. And another day saying, wow, the young people are our hope, mm -hmm. you know? And so you go to Anarchapulco and you uh, emerge uh, energized and with hope because you see young people who get it. They understand what's happening. They understand that there is a, politics is a swamp. Washington DC is a swamp. System is rigged. Maybe the system was only rigged against a few people, but now the system is rigged almost against everybody. And so that Deutsche Bank um, statistic that one tenth of one percent of the wealth of the uh, of the people of the U.S. own as much as ninety percent of the rest of us. I mean, this is like. A transformation is taking place before our very eyes, and they don't want us to see it. But there was an investigative journalist who sent me something, well, I can't, what was it like about 2000 and maybe 10. Mm -hmm. And basically what he did was he listed the Fortune 500 companies and he listed the majority shareholders prior to 2007, mm -hmm. so-called economic crisis <coughs> been talking too much yeah. and then he listed the ones as of like 2009 mm -hmm. a new crew so basically uh, there was a study that was done <coughs> by uh, some article some organization and uh, the article reported that now there were three corporations that were majority or that were the largest shareholder in all of the fortune 500 companies mm -hmm. three and they're not the same three that were prior to 2007. so basically if the u.s economy is the titanic the chairs on the deck were switched. And now those people who used to own the United States no longer own the United States and a new crew do. Now, what does that tell us? This is something that I predicted. I'm not the only one. I took it to Michael Hudson. Michael Hudson said, Absolutely, yes. I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Hudson. He's an economist. And so basically what happened in the Soviet Union under Gorbachev and Russia under Boris Yeltsin was that the um, state-owned enterprises SOEs, the state-owned enterprises in the Soviet Union, the people had been uh, drained of all of their wealth, all of their income, all of their money, all of their savings went down to pennies on a dollar or pennies on a ruble. <coughs> And so when the time came for the sale of the state-owned enterprises, nobody was able to buy. Mm -hmm. And the entire economy of the Soviet Union slash Russia fell into the hands of 11 people. And that's who we call the oligarchs. Now you have to, you have, to have that background to understand what's going on in 2016, 17, and 18 with Trump. Because the attack on Russia and the attack on the Russians and the attack on Trump and the Russians is not an attack on Trump because he was trying to do business with Russia. Because remember, he was trying to do business with Russia and the Russians turned him down. Mm -hmm. He didn't get what he wanted. But this is about Trump and his relationship with those 11 oligarchs in Russia. This is completely different. And if you don't get it, it goes right over your head, right? Okay, and then you've got these people 
who made their plan, worked their plan, their plan was working for them, and then all of a sudden Trump comes in and blindsides everybody and knocks them out of the way. And the friends, thank you so much, and the friends of the oligarchs over there are the ones now who have their control over mm -hmm. the U.S. political system. Mm -hmm. And they gotta have a fight, they gotta duke it out. Well, yeah, I have to say, it makes me sick seeing um, the continuation of the military-industrial complex's attempt to claim that Iran was involved in 9-11, which is a joke, uh, to see the attempts of destabilization and proxy wars in Syria continue. You know, I, I saw people that were uh, pro-Obama uh, saying this was great then and now it's terrible when, when it's Trump or saying things that were terrible, uh, you know, people were, who are against Obama saying that's terrible that Obama's doing that, say it's okay now that Trump does it. Yeah. And you see that left right kind of thing. And I, I'm just, I'm wondering, are we ever going to see an end to this all out war and this conflict and this n necessity for the political establishment to create destabilization in order to create, you know, uh, what do you call that, uh, enslavement through chaos? Um, mm -hmm. uh, are we ever going to see the end of this? Because you've been out in these countries and you've seen it for yeah. yourself. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you see, um, what we have to do uh, along the lines of the Paolo Freire paradigm, mm -hmm. that cultural synthesis is that we have to create a new culture. Mm -hmm. We have to create a culture of peace. Mm -hmm. If we want peace, we gotta create the new culture. We've gotta unrig ourselves because we've been rigged for hundreds of years. And w that rigging has been intensified by the propagandizing that has been done by the military, industrial, banking, media, congressional complex, prison complex, right? So we've got all of these complexes and they're all feeding us all of this gobbledygook and people are believing it. So we have to create a new culture. How do we create a new culture? The Scientific American article that I referenced in my remarks is a analysis of several polls and what those polls tell us is that we've become more embedded in our silos. You know, Cy Hirsch talks about the siloing of uh, intelligence, US intelligence, so that uh, you stovepipe it and it goes from the place where it was fabricated because it's fake and it goes directly on that pipeline into the vice president's office, Dick Cheney, these are real instances, and then from there it becomes uh, US policy that's carried out. Mm -hmm. And it's all based on fake information. And so you, that's how you get the Bush administration lying 935 times to the American public, uh, well, not just the American public, but they had lied to the world mm -hmm. and uh, told the world that Iraq had uh, BMD, you know, you all know the story. Mm -hmm. And that same kind of lying has been used for uh, justifications in Libya and Syria. That's why it was so disappointing to see the general come over here at the Red Pill Expo and then start talking about Syria and Iran. And I mean, you know, I just appreciate what that man did. There's a man that stood up and asked, you know, what about the Palestinians and, and tried to press him on points because the man was kind of pushing for a proxy war as if we haven't seen enough of those. We've seen too many of those. And so the so 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 basically, this is where my idea of the power cells comes in because uh, the Scientific American article will be uh, sort of a great foundation to explain how we can become more, how we do become more embedded in our own silos. And so uh, one of the findings of the Scientific American article was that people don't traverse the silo they stay there and so my friend today uh feeds my ignorance about what's going on in the other silo and the only way we can break down 
this uh, balkanization of the public. I'm a Democrat. I'm a yellow dog Democrat. I'm going to vote Democrat. I don't care if a yellow dog is running for Democrat. I'm going to vote Democrat. You know that I'm from I'm from the South. You know, that's what we say. I mean, sounds like dog. Pepsi and Coke. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So how do we create a new identity? Now, part of the scientific American article that I did not discuss, one of the findings was that what was needed, how you can break those down, is what they say is that what's needed is a supra identity. Rather than the identity, the strict identity, I'm left, which I am, and um, uh, you're right, and we can't talk to each other, or I'm Democrat and you're Republican. Well, hey, I'll add, that, I'll, I'll add to that for a second. I mean, I consider myself an anarcho-capitalist. I know that yeah. you don't, but we're talking together right now and well, we can have a conversation. Minute. I don't know if I, you know. I, I, I've I mean, never heard you say you're not. Well, yeah, maybe maybe you want to uh, kick off the capitalist part and, you know, I'll stick with the anarcho first. <laughs> but, but, but we're having this conversation now. That's, that's yeah, the point, yeah. Yeah. And so um, the Scientific American article says that we need to create, basically the conclusion is what Paolo Freire told us back in 1960, and that is that we need a new identity. Okay, so what's that identity gonna be and what's the procedure by which we can do that? People are talking about, okay, we wanna take our country back, but they don't have a clue as to how you're gonna do it when all of your friends think just like you. And there's nothing there that's going to challenge you. And even when it comes to you and it challenges you, it's not in the way that's going to really affect you. So uh, these things are called disorienting dilemmas. When people are confronted with sort of life-changing information in ways that affect them so that they do change. And that's what I want to do with the power cells. So like you and I, sitting at the same table in the same room, I want to get the populist left to the populist right, the left, the right, the center. I want all of us in one table, in one, at one table, in one room. And then what we need to do is to do some unrigging exercises. And these things all come from behavioral sciences. So there's strict methodolo methodologies that can be used in order to do these particular exercises. So the idea would be that people would spend like a day with me and a team, and we would go through each one of these steps. So the idea is that we go through these exercises that help me see you, I see through you. Mm -hmm. You see through me. I see your heart beating. Mm -hmm. I see, you see my heart beating. Mm -hmm. And then there's a magic that can happen, right? Mm -hmm. And I've seen it happen. I know it happens. Uh, it happened to me in Oklahoma. Oklahoma! Mm -hmm. I'm with some, some, uh, I, I'm, uh, 2008, running on the Green Party ticket mm -hmm. in Oklahoma at an event. These guys came to an event. They left one event and went to the second event, which was kind of like a town hall yeah. meeting thing. So they go to that event. And these are like, I mean, if you looked at them, you would think that they were, I mean, they're tall, they're big, they're male and they're white and they don't have long hair. Long hair, those are my people. Piercing, those are my people. Right? Well, I'm sorry to hear. <laughs> you don't have piercing either? I used to. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, those are my people, right? These are big, maybe like military guys or something. You're kind of scared of them. They go to the town hall meeting. The town hall meeting is full of black women. And the black women, they were angry. So they came to mouth off. 
and they talked and they talked and they talked and they were talking about reparations and then one of the white guys said I never thought about it that way and then the conversation changed from the black women mouthing off to the black women and the white men actually I witnessed this actually talking about reparations and it was a transformative moment so now we do the same thing in every one of our 50 states and we don't come with any preconceived ideas. We don't come with any agenda because every community is different. Every community has its own set of issues, its own problems, and its own unique set of solutions. It's not for me as an outsider to dictate what their solutions are. It's for them to find their way to what they agree on. And then actually do something within 24 hours, do something. And I oversee all of that so that we create the new culture of cooperation where before there was a culture of you're this, I'm that, and there's a wall between us. Now we sit down and if they can find their way through one day, one solution, one success, they'll find many more successes together. And that's what I believe the power of the power cells is. It's a practical way for us to get out of our silos, to break down the barriers that have been falsely created, but that are real now, and uh, figure out a way forward together. Wow, that was very insightful. And I think our end goal is all just free humanity, peace and understanding. That's right. And that's all it has ever come down to. But we get lost along the way. So I really appreciate you talking with us today. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Like what you see here, Wham? Don't forget to check the links below. GoFundMe, Patreon, we can't do it without you. Any donation is very much appreciated, especially as we are so overwhelmingly demonetized and censored by YouTube as the ADL comes in and flags all of our content as hate speech. Also, check our Bitcoin address in the description as well as on the screen for you to scan if you please. And also find us at steemit.com at at Josh Sigurdsson, the future of social media where you get paid in the upvote of your post in Steam, the cryptocurrency. But until next time, this is Josh Searton signing out for World Alternative Media. Find the truth, be the change.